morning, everyone. One of the benefits of um, being the pastor is when you tell the person who's the music director that you really like Mumford and Sons. Sometimes they, you know, <laughs> sometimes they, they follow up, follow along. Thank you, Julian. Um, for those of you who know me, my name is Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. I'm the lead pastor of the Aloft, and my pronouns are he and him. I'm excited to have you here this morning and worship with us. We at the Loft are a progressive Christian community that strives to follow Jesus' spiritual path of radical compassion by being unapologetically inclusive, by being conversation-oriented, and by teaching theologies that promote the flourishing of all life. And so what this means is that we try to create a space where everybody feels like they belong. And so regardless of your race, gender, class, sexual orientation, regardless of where you are on a spectrum of belief, we want you to feel welcome in this place. We want you to grow to have a sense of belonging in this community. Um, we, we are continuing our, our new sermon series uh, titled Better Together. Um, this series is really about trying to figure out what it means for us to be and grow together as a community through the lens of recognizing and working through our particular loneliness, the ways in which so many of us um, struggle with loneliness to the extent that you see more and more articles, more and more essays, more and more things being written about the impact that loneliness has on not only our physical health, but also our emotional health as well. Now, loneliness is defined as a subjective feeling that you're lacking in the social connections that you need. And so in this sense, loneliness can feel like being stranded or feel like being cut off from the people with whom you belong. Even if you are surrounded by other people, you may still struggle with loneliness if those relationships or those connections aren't deep and meaningful in a way that fits the need that you have. And so for those of us who struggle with loneliness, the, the obvious solution, some might say, would be just to go and spend time with people, right? Just go hang out with people. And, and, and while that sounds logical, um, we all know that it's not quite that easy. There's all these other things that we have to work through even to take the effort, to make the effort to actually go do that. And now, while there are several practices uh, that I think we should adopt to address our longing for a community to kind of meet the need and to attend to our loneliness, um, the most important one we're going to talk about, which is what we're going to talk about today, I believe is somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, I believe Jesus teaches his disciples that before we build trust and relationships with our communities, we must first deepen our connection with ourselves. And once we do this, this kind of builds a foundation upon which we can establish and strengthen new and even existing relationships. And so this is what we're going to talk about in worship today. But before we get into that, we want to spend a few minutes um, saying hello to one another, greeting one another, um, getting something to drink, some coffee. Uh, I actually had two strong of a cu cup of coffee today, so I'm actually going to try to just keep down in the water and hope it kind of levels me out. Uh, but yeah, we call this time community care. So I invite you to, to say hello to one another, say hi to someone who you maybe you haven't met before, and help us become more than Sunday friends. This morning's scripture comes from Luke 10, 38 through 42. While Jesus and his disciples were traveling, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him as a guest. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his message. By contrast, Martha was preoccupied with getting everything ready for their meal. So Martha came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better part. It won't be taken away from her. There is in every person something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in themselves. There is in you something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. You see, nobody like you has ever been born, and no one like you will ever be born again. You are the only one. And if you miss the sound of the genuine in you, you will feel incomplete for the rest of your life because you will never be able to fully understand who you truly are. 
in the Gospel of Mark, there is this story about Jesus and his disciples, and they had just arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, and, and they encountered a man whom Scripture describes as being possessed by a multitude of demons, legion. The man was in pain and suffering, and the, the demons inside of him knew who Jesus was, and, and, and they were worried that Jesus would hurt them. And so Jesus asked this man one question. He says, who are you? What is your name? And for a moment, the man whose mind had been confused seemed to, to, to write itself, and he said, that's it. I, I don't know who I am. There are legions of me. And I wonder if perhaps this was the man thinking that if he only knew who he truly was, he would be whole again. And so the burden I have to say to you this morning is, what is your name? Who are you? And can you find a way to hear the sound of the genuine in yourself? There are so many noises going on inside all of us, so many echoes of all sorts, so many internalized ideas and, and narratives that distract us. It, and, and it makes me, me wonder if we can get still enough, not, not quiet, but, but indeed still enough to hear our true self, the sound of the genuine within. Now, I don't know if you can, but this is your life's assignment. This first section of what I read this morning is part of a baccalaureate address given by Howard Thurman at Spelman College in 1980. And I believe it goes to the heart of what we are going to talk about today. It gets at the heart of what these passages are discussing that we will explore. We see Mary and Martha, in a way, trying to listen to the sound of the genuine in themselves in different ways, and, and see Jesus pointing out which one, in fact, was listening to their true self. Martha had reason to be upset. When we read this passage and we see that Martha was doing all the work and preparing all the things for the company that they had, Martha was doing a, and performing a socially accepted role of, of caretaking. And we must remember that it wasn't just Jesus in that room, it was Jesus and his disciples. She, she would have been, in her mind, responsible for making sure that she was providing for the men in that space, in this patriarchal society. Mary, however, was breaking cultural boundaries, breaking gender boundaries by sitting at the feet of Jesus. She was doing something that women were not supposed to do. Now, Martha, because she feels as though her sister is not, not, uh, that she's not helping, that she's not performing her assigned task, that perhaps she is breaking the rules, she is upset, and she wants Jesus to hold her sister accountable. She wants Jesus to tell her, hey, she should help. Look at what I am doing. And I think what we, what we see in Martha is something that I believe happens to us so often when we are trying to listen and discover our own inner voice and our own inner self is that we can get stuck in what we are supposed to do. We can get stuck in the ideas of what we should be doing. One of the things that, that my therapist often says is we have to be careful about letting people should all over us. And that's always been helpful for me, right, to understand that some people will, if you let them should, all over you. And this shoulding 
is one of the ways we end up stifling our capacity to, to hear the sound of our own genuine. These socially constructed roles can distract us. And, and to be clear, it's not, it's not that these roles that we play are not important, right? The role that we play as perhaps a partner or as, as a parent or as, as, as a child, as a friend, any of these roles that we may adopt. It's not that they are not important. Rather, what, what we have to discern, we have to learn to discern is, is the relative importance we are placing upon them. How much do we let this role define the totality of who we are? And with respect to, to gender, I believe that there are some of these roles that really do contribute to the struggle of loneliness that so many of us have. Indeed, there are ways in which Gender performance stifles us from hearing the sound of our genuine. With respect to women, there, there is a quote from the, the book by Dr. Vivek Murthy I want to read here. He, he writes that there is a tendency for women to become selfless or voiceless in relationships, to care for others by diminishing themselves, to use their gifts for empathy and relationship, to cover over their own feelings and thoughts and to begin not to know what they want and know, a forgetting to an extent of who they truly are. Studies are showing that this is a, when women are, tend to struggle with loneliness, those gendered as, as women, that this is a big part of what is going on internally, that, that women tend to blame themselves when relationships fail. There's something that they feel as though they did because they have been socially constructed and socialized to be the people who maintain relationships through empathy and compassion, even at the detriment of themselves. This can lead to a particular kind of internalized shame, which ultimately results in loneliness. And we understand that while this is a common phenomenon today, as, as Dr. Murthy is writing, we see in this passage that, that, that the socialization of gender is, is ancient. It is, in fact, ancient, and it is beyond our Western culture. It is, in fact, pervasive in humanity. Far, far more cultures than just ours are patriarchal in this particular kind of way. And indeed, this kind of stratification impacts men as well. The way in which men are socialized can also stifle us from hearing the sound of our genuine. He writes, men are less likely than women to admit feeling lonely. They'll suffer in silence as if it's required of them, and over time, their loneliness will deplete their energy, change their personalities, and erode their health. This pattern repeats itself in almost every culture. Indeed, men would just rather suffer often in silence, not really able or willing to admit what is going on in, internally, not quite knowing how to bridge that gap and, and to be vulnerable with someone, to open up about what is going on inside. Because we, as men, are often socialized to believe that closeness is not masculine, that feeling an intimate connection with an, uh, another man is not masculine. So we are told to make sure we, we, we practice proper emotional expression. We should be angry, right? That, that we can be hungry, that, that, that we can be ambitious, that, that we can do things that fit within a very narrow scope of what it means to be a man, so to speak. And again, this stifles our capacity to hear the, the truth of who we are are. It cuts us off from feeling and knowing ourselves. And so what we see in this story, what we see is Mary breaking out of these rigid labels. What we see is Mary demonstrating that these labels have been placed upon us and can, in fact, harm us from listening to ourselves. 
we see Mary fulfilling the second part of the greatest commandment. So in the, in, in the scripture prior to this is the story of the Good Samaritan, where it's more about what we are to go and do to love God and neighbor and self. And what we see in that passage in the Good Samaritan is someone loving their neighbor. And what we see in Mary is, in fact, what it looks like to love God. And at times, that requires us to be still, to be quiet, to sit, and to listen, and to focus on the most important thing in that moment, which is to be present to ourselves, to our family, to our friends, to discover who we are. And what we see Mary doing is actually focusing on the most important thing she could have been doing at that time, listening to Jesus. And what we see in, in, in Martha, what we see Jesus teaching Martha, is that we must let go of the blame, shame, and judgment that has been forced upon us by these social norms. There was resentment that I'm sure she had towards Mary. There was frustration that why does she get to do this thing and I have to do all this service and social work? Why can't I be in that particular kind of place and learn like Jesus? And what Jesus tells her is, in fact, you can. You can also break out of the boundaries you have placed upon yourself or that you have willingly accepted. You see, the interesting thing is, I think we all know that these social norms don't actually lead to our liberation. Many of these social norms don't actually help us feel as though we are living into our full humanity. Something sometimes feels wrong when, when, when we try to convince ourselves we're not judging ourselves or judging someone else. There is this internal feeling that we know is off balance. And yet we still follow these norms. And, and so I'm often left wondering, why? I believe one of the reasons is, is fear. We often can be afraid of how others will look at us, what they might say, what they might think. And we know that this matters in our society. It matters in terms of relationships. It matters in terms of jobs. It, it matters in terms of any number of other things. And, it, and, it, and often that can be a controlling mechanism to make sure that we are compliant and make sure that we fall in line with everyone else as we are afraid of what will happen if we do not. And yet I often wonder if, if perhaps some of that fear or perhaps another reason we follow these norms is because we are committed to them because in our experience they have kept us safe. Knowing how we're supposed to be in relationship to others, falling in line, co complying and cooperating and, and doing the things that the world expects of us in the way it expects us to do it allows us to just go through life. Even if we are able to connect with our deepest sense of self. At least we'll know we are safe. These social norms, I believe, they, they keep us alive. But what Jesus shows us is that they restrict our ability to live. They restrict our ability to know ourselves. And so as Mary demonstrates, to begin to know ourselves can be a courageous and boundary-breaking to really get to know ourselves and prioritize learning who we are. It requires stillness, and it requires solitude to discern what we value and why we respond to the world and other people in the way that we do. And so the first set of questions I would love for y'all to spend some time thinking about are, in fact, questions that should hopefully prompt us to do some of this inner work to begin to discover about our, a little bit about ourselves. Perhaps, how these, perhaps you've thought of some of these questions before, and maybe your answers by now may shift, may change. Maybe they have evolved. So it's an opportunity for us to begin to practice a little quiet. I don't know if we can get still in this place, but we can definitely get quiet and discern perhaps a bit more who we are. What do you most love doing and why? What do you dread? How do you respond to stress? What are you most grateful for? 
And what do you yearn for? These are just basic introductory questions, but I believe they can serve as a guidepost, if you will, to point the way to ourselves. So spend a few minutes in conversation, and then we will come back with announcements and worship. Good morning, everyone. My name is Wesley. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, and this morning, I have your announcements. Um, if you're new to community, uh, all of the announcements that I'm about to make are in our newsletter that comes out on Fridays. Uh, so if you're not already on the newsletter, please consider signing up by going to the loftdelay.org slash sign up or scanning the QR code uh, that's on the little things on the table. Um, happening today, we have a few things happening today. We have our newish member lunch. So uh, after the gathering here at 1230, just across the way in Upper Helms, uh, we just have a little lunch for people who are still folding into the community. If you still consider yourself new or newish, please join us. Uh, we have delicious food uh, and wonderful company. So that's today. Uh, later on today, we also have the blessing of the animals. Uh, we all have little fur for family members, um, and they deserve a blessing. And so that's happening today at 4 p.m. in the courtyard. So, you know, go home, take a little nap, and then bring your fur babies back uh, to get blessed in our courtyard. Um, also happening this week in groups, we have a couple groups meeting. So today, the LGBTQ plus group is meeting after the, an the blessing of the animals in the courtyard. So bring your fur baby, stay for a little fun conversation uh, with our queer community. Um, and then this week on, on Thursday, the Westwood group is meeting uh, in Westwood, 7 p.m.-ish. So if you're not already on any of those lists, let me know, um, and I can put you on them so you'll get the announcement uh, when they're made available. Um, also happening uh, next Sunday is our voter engagement event. Uh, we're, we are partnering with LA Voice to do a little uh, uh, voter engagement work um, at 12.15 after this gathering. Uh, learn about local ballot measures and about how to use your vote to pursue a more, and just, a more loving and just Los Angeles. Um, so that's just to come uh, after, the, after the gathering. Join us there. Uh, I think it's downstairs in the Wesley room. Yep, there it is. Um, Sunday, October 20th, so two Sundays from now, is our fall festival. It's our big sort of fall kickoff. It's also the chili cook-off and the dessert bake-off. So if you're, if you're a master of chili, please bring that recipe. If you're a master of a dessert, bring that recipe uh, and have a, a secret panel of people vote on it and, and elect you the winner. Uh, so I think there's two, two awards for, for that cook-off. But that's uh, October 20th. That's after the gathering here. What else we got going on? Oh, this Tuesday, a last-minute event got added to our um, calendar. So it's on Tuesday. We have a two-film event this Tuesday where we'll be screening We the People uh, and For Our Daughters here in the loft as part of a, what is the organization called? Vote, uh, Vote Common Good. It's uh, an organization led by Doug Paget. He's uh, one of the uh, leaders in, or was in, in the emergent church movement. Um, so he'll be, his organization is helping uh, Christians figure out how to vote their values and conscious, and these are two videos that they're using as part of that education. Um, and lastly, I want to bring up Jean Rose Smith, who has an announcement for us, so I'll just hand off the mic. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thanks for letting me talk, y'all. I'm Jean Rose Smith. I use she, her pronouns. I'm at the 580 Cafe. I'm the chaplain there at, you may have heard of the school up the road, UCLA. Sound familiar to anybody? Okay, but the news here is we also are practicing our inclusion and our grace, and we welcome all college students from ages 18 to whatever, because we do have students who are, believe it or not, even older than I. Um, so it's a great, good place for us to build community. Listening to your sermon today, your message, Chris, about loss, being lost and desperate and lonely. Um, if you've been to college or have been new in a community, you know how it feels to come to a place and not know anybody. The, the communities that we work with tend to be on the really underserved, underrepresented, historically excluded from access to higher education. And we have a lot of students um, who just need a space to feel loved, to feel welcome, to be honored for who they are. So I'm coming today with a very specific ask. Um, we are really also very clear on our stance in terms of immigration um, from international students and from people being displaced from their homelands because of economics or political strife, uh, because of their gender identity or their orientation. So I'm coming with a specific concern for our immigrant students, one especially, who um, came here eight years ago 
and came as, I would only put it as human trafficked to do domestic work in a home uh, seven days a week, 12 to 15 hours a day uh, with very little rest. But her end goal was to go to college, was to get a college degree. So for the last eight years, she has literally traveled the United States dodging <laughs> the immigration officials because her immigration papers were removed when she left the situation that had brought her in. And so that changed her status and left her in the margins. Uh, unfortunately, well, first of all and foremost, she achieved her goal. She is at UCLA as an undergraduate student, which I think shows remarkable resolve, determination, and capacity to struggle, as I know she has struggled for eight years, to wind up at UCLA pursuing mathematics. So, you know, she has the academic chops. She also has the soul and the determination. She was a little lost because she didn't know her. she's facing um, a legal deportation order where she needs to go and present her case, which should be won simply because of the recorded abuse and violations of her human rights. But the funding is the problem. She can afford housing, believe it or not. She has a car, believe it or not. She can take care of herself, but this one piece is hanging over her head for her to actually have legal counsel so that she can adjust her paperwork and stay and finish her degree. So that's one of the things we, we talk about is how do we, as the beloved community here, support students like this whose story of work and determination and hope is very real to us and we don't need to you know, know who she is in many ways because our goal is to share the abundance we have. Westwood has been gracious to donate a third of what we need to cover. 580 is covering a third and we have a little bit more to go. So I'm looking for additional support just to say to her, you may be lost, you may be desperate, but there are people with good hearts, good conscience, and who have that spirit of God's all-inclusive abiding love to share with, with whoever, not needing recognition, not needing acclamation, but saying we believe, we honor, and we affirm the story. And we will find a way to, to help her do that. I will be in court with her when the time comes. That's the accompaniment we will do as the church. So this is how we share God's love, openly, expansively, and without limitation. And I hope you can join us. If you need more information uh, about 580, I have some little cards. You can look us up on Instagram. It's really hard, 580 Cafe. And our website is 580cafe.com. So check it out. Feel free to talk with Chris or anyone here. What we do, the kinds of resources, additional support we may need. Uh, Maria Andrea knows. I said I see you there. Um, we, take, we are open to students Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. We serve two meals. Everything is free. Two meals um, a week, Tuesday and Thursday for the gathered community. And one last thing, this is going to be one heck of a quarter because given the current geopolitical environment, many of our students are actually being very oppressed <laughs> and limited in their free speech, in their gathering, in their speaking out for justice on behalf of their people and their communities. So I covet your prayers for our community at UCLA as we seek to find God's wisdom and justice as we move through these very difficult days. So thank you, and um, see me if you need, need any questions or any comments you want to make. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for that. Uh, the, the reading today is Luke 15, 25 through 32. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of his servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in, but his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, look, I've served you all, served you all these years and I've never disobeyed your instruction. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, son, you are always with me, 
and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. I should say, um, in terms of the announcement uh, Jean Rose Smith made, is that um, if you want to make a donation specifically to um, 580 or specifically to the student at 580, we, I would invite you to give to our Good Samaritan account. Um, so you can get online at the loftla.org backslash give, ways to give, I think. I don't know if we can put that, so there we go. Uh, give, yeah, there we go. Um, and just put in the, um, you know, the comment that that's what it's for. Um, and that would be, we would really appreciate that support. Our Good Samaritan account is something that we really, again, we just, that's what we use to help to serve the community. Um, it's one of the ways I'm actually really proud of what we're able to do in this church. Um, and yet, if you also find in your heart to give to us to support to the work that we're doing, we always want to encourage that as well because it allows us to do some of the amazing, amazing things that I think we're able uh, to do in this place. Now, what... Um, what I have been describing in the previous, like, first part of the sermon as getting to know yourself or self-knowledge um, is often expressed by the term, um, particularly in, like, middle and upper class communities, as um, finding yourself. It's usually people describe it as, like, hey, I got to go find myself. Um, and, and I'll be honest, when, when I was younger, um, I would, you know, and I would hear that term, uh, I just was like, this is dumb. <laughs> I, I, you know, like, it'd be, like, my ideas, like, you know, people, like, backpacking through Europe, you know, by the, you know, I, like, would just going from train to train, going places, and, and it just seemed so classist to me, because it seemed like something that only people in a certain kind of luxury were able to do, a certain kind of economic status was able to do it, and it really wasn't until I began to do my own inner work and deal with my own resentment and issues with respect to economics to understand that at its core, this journey of self-discovery, this finding yourself, doesn't require you to go anywhere, but it does require you to listen to yourself, to be still and listen to those around you to help you understand a bit more about who you are. Self-knowledge, connecting to the truth of who we are, is essential, I believe, for sustaining and creating relationships that help us combat loneliness. An increase in growing self-awareness of who we are gives us a foundation upon which we can establish new relationships based on the truth of who we are and not the social masks that we may intentionally or inadvertently be wearing. So these relationships can actually be authentic and deep and sustainable because we are engaging each other through the sound of our genuine. Now, Jesus gives an example of what this self-awareness does and does not look like in the story of the prodigal son. And we read the second part of that story because I really want to begin by focusing on the older son, usually someone who's not necessarily discussed when this parable is talked about. But I believe we are often socialized to be like, to think like the older brother. We are taught as, as children often to believe in a kind of strict meritocracy, right? That you earn everything you get, that's the way it's supposed to be. We are taught to believe that we are entitled to what we feel like we deserve. And we are taught to be obedient and loyal to our families, to our parents, to our communities. Franciscan priest Richard Rohr calls this kind of behavior uh, listening to our inner voice listening to our ego, or, or perhaps he uses the term, uh, following our loyal soldier, right? The part of us that gives us a sense of identity and structure. And, and, and to be sure, for the first part of our lives, it is critical that we listen to this voice because it gets us through so many things. It really gets us through the first part of our lives safely. This part of us teaches us to protect our bodies, to have the kind of impulse control that gives us dignity, direction, allows us to cultivate a, a feeling of, of significance and helps us establish boundaries that we need to have, right, to keep us safe. Paradoxically, this part of us can give us so much security, it can give us so much validation that we often, we may, 
we may confuse it for the sound of our own genuine, or we may confuse it for the voice of God. And when we get these things confused, it really stifles our ability to listen for either of those voices. And I believe this is what we see in the response of the older son to his father. The older son is listening to his loyal soldier, his commitment to a particular understanding of the rules. He is committed to a kind of meritocracy and obedience. He is telling his father, I have done the things that I was supposed to do. I was the good son. I was the one who stayed and worked. I was the one who did all these things. And, 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 and you haven't even given me a goat. You haven't given me anything, and you give him so much. The brother's commitment to the rules, though, his commitment to follow this loyal soldier ultimately ends up robbing him of some aspect of joy, some aspect of growth, or a way in which he might actually confront and disentangle that loyal soldier from the sound of his genuine because his father invites him to the celebration, but, but he's so frustrated, he's so resentful, we don't ever know if he actually attended. And his father begs him, and he just, we just don't end up knowing what happened. And I believe this sometimes can be the way in which we rob ourselves from opportunities to grow, opportunities to develop opportunities to mature and listen to who we are. We can just go, get so stuck on the idea that we are right rather than doing the work to discover what it looks like to, to be right. You see, I believe there's a deeper voice of God that we must learn to hear if we are to get to know who we truly are, if we are to learn how to listen to the sound of our genuine. And, and this is what we see in the younger son. We see someone who appears to have learned how to distinguish between his inner voice, his ego, if you will, and the prompting of the divine. In, in, in verse 17, further along, we didn't read it, the writer says that the younger son came to his senses. He's working with pigs, even though he's a person of Jewish descent, so this would have been an abomination, something that no one would have wanted to do. And perhaps it was because he had suffered so much. He had went through so much destabilization, it shook him awake, and he came to his senses by himself with the pigs. And I believe it points to the importance of solitude and learning how to listen to the sound of our genuine. I, I wonder if that would have happened had he not had this particular kind of suffering, if he had not had this particular kind of tragic event, or if he had even not had the opportunity to think about this by himself, what he had gotten to this conclusion. You see, solitude gives us time to listen to ourselves, time for self reflection, time that we often neglect because sometimes the things that come up when we do that, those thoughts, those feelings, they're painful. They require us to do some healing. And it is much easier to stay busy, as we discussed last week, rather than tend to our own inner wounds. And yet within the story of the younger brother, we see that this is in fact what he does. I believe we see three practices that, that can help us tend to this internal pain that comes along with self-reflection and deepening our knowledge of ourselves. And the first act we see in this story is a kind of self-compassion, a way in which he's compassionate towards himself. He, in his time with the pigs, he, he says to himself that I'm better off, I would be better off as one of my father's servants than I am right now. The people who he've hired they are living better than me. I should go home. I believe compassion helps us form a bridge between self-knowledge and self-acceptance. And in this moment, as he's discovering who he is, he has to accept the mistakes that he made and the consequences for his actions. He also cultivates a kind of loving kindness towards himself. And I believe that loving kindness, that way he's able to look at himself and say, I know I made a mistake, but I'm willing to go home. This is the first step on a path that I believe leads us, helps us cross that bridge. 
You see, self-compassion softens the hurt or, or it shields us from the pain of judgment and ridicule of people who do not understand who we are. We have to be able to love ourselves and be compassionate for ourselves so in those moments when we think we experience judgment or we do, in fact, experience judgment, we can love ourselves. I believe the second, what we see in this story, this, the second aspect is a kind of gratefulness, right? He's, his father runs to him. He, his father sees his son, and he, and he runs to them, and the son confesses that he has sinned against God and his father, and he only wants to return as a servant. He understands that he has made a mistake and that he may not want to be taken back. But despite this, despite this admission, his father celebrates his return. Practices of gratefulness, they have the power to change how we see ourselves. They have the power to change how others around us see who we are. This shift, this kind of shift of gratefulness. It, it helps us focus, I believe, on appreciating what we have rather than ruminating on what we don't. Thinking about the times and ways in which we feel grateful can allow us to connect with the truth of who we are rather than the mask that we carry or that we wear that tells us we should have more, be more, do more. And the third thing I think we see in this story that's helpful for discovering the truth of who we are is the importance of cultivation, a kind, cultivating a kind of awe and wonder. I cannot imagine how the younger son felt when despite all that he had done, his father hugs him. His father says, I love you. And his father's happy to see him and celebrates him, celebrates him. Because even though he had messed up so bad, I know so many times we can feel as though, especially as, uh, to our parents, that we've done something wrong, that perhaps we've done something so harmful that that relationship cannot be mended. How must it feel how must it have felt to be loved like that? To experience that kind of love, how must it feel to love someone like that? And so the question I want to ask you all before we wrap up is, what makes you feel awestruck? What helps you feel connected to the deepest sense of love that we know exists? What makes you have a sense of awe? Is it perhaps nature? I know for me, going to Yosemite, going to Yellowstone, going to some of these parks, going to the beach allows me to, to see something bigger than myself, and it does give me a sense of awe. Perhaps it is art of some kind, Perhaps it is paintings, perhaps it is theater, perhaps it is tele television. It could be any number of kinds of art that strikes you with awe. Maybe it's playing with your children or, or grandchildren and seeing them in this particular kind of moment and stepping back and just being taken in by the joy that you see. But for me, time and again, what I've come to realize about myself is when I'm trying to reground myself in the truth of who I am and I'm trying to pay attention to the sound of my genuine, one of the practices I have is to listen to music and in particular listen to music I love, gospel music, any other kind of music, but there is a song that we, we sing here often enough that for me always is something that reminds me of how fortunate I am. It reminds me to have compassion for myself, and it helps me be grateful for what I have and grateful for what God has done 
for me and through me. And so when we sing, you know my name, and you see me in the back, standing there, you often see tears flowing down my face because the lyrics of that song touch me in a certain kind of way. Oh, how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk with me. Oh, how you tell me that I am your own, and, and so I trust you with my life. No fire can burn me. No battle can turn me. No mountain can stop me because you hold my hand. And now I am walking in your victory because your power is within me. No giant can defeat me because you hold my hand. This song reminds me, helps me remember of what I have been through, what God has been through with me and how I've been able to overcome, how I've been able to flourish, and how I still have so much more than though God is calling me to do. And it strikes me with awe. These practices, like listening to music, they deepen our connection with ourselves, even as they remind us that we are a part of something profoundly interconnected. They remind us that we are a part of something much greater than ourselves. And when we begin reaching out to one another from this place of self-knowledge, we discover that we have the power to build communities, that we have the capacity to transform ourselves and the world. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to invite the children to come up and the band and everybody to come up to have them sing and do all their things. Um, and then after that, uh, we will move in with communion um, and, and, and wrap up worship. So on first Sundays, uh, we have a ritual practice of Holy Communion. It's a practice where all people are invited to participate, um, but you are not compelled to participate. It is fully open up to you. On the night in which Jesus gathered with his disciples and his friends in the upper room, uh, to celebrate Passover. I imagine they were discussing all the work they had done. They were building and growing with each other, developing community, if you will. And, and Jesus takes this bread and he lifts it up and he tells a story about how this bread represents how they are bound together in community. Indeed, this meal was used to tell the story of the liberation of his people, the way in which God had delivered them from Egypt, delivered them from bondage. And in telling this story, they are able to place themselves in the broad narrative of their community. And similarly, when, when, when we practice this table fellowship, we are invited to do the same, to place ourselves in the story of salvation and redemption as participants, not just as spectators. We do this so we know with confidence that God has heard our cry, that God has also pulled us out of bondage to harmful theologies and traumatic relationships. We tell this story so we can live into it, so we can own it and claim it, so that everybody knows that we are in a place where we belong. We tell this story so you can remember who we are and whose we are, so that we can create communities of peace and love and justice. Jesus takes the cup and he raises it and he blesses it. And this cup represents a cup of salvation, a, a new covenant which all people, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, could join in and participate. This kind of boundary-breaking ideology, this idea that all are welcome, this is a radical concept. 
We saw this in the stories we discussed today, this elimination of hierarchies, this elimination of, of, of places that might allow us to feel less than the full human, human that we are. You see, in the very act of nourishing our bodies with the bread of life and in quenching our thirst for love with the cup of salvation, we are, in fact, made new in Christ. We are empowered to surrender the ideas of position and power and supremacist thinking in order to love each other. We are called to embody the solidaristic love that we see in Jesus, knowing that for us that means we must live in the full expression of who we are, and that if someone is denied the capacity to express their full humanity, then we are not transformed in Christ. We are not faithfully engaging in table fellowship if someone has to wear a mask to feel like they belong. The cup of salvation represents our delivery from the bondage of individualism and selfishness because salvation is a communal event. And in taking this cup, we are reminded that our liberation is interconnected, that none of us are free until all of us are free. And so what I want to do is invite you to participate in this sacrament. We have right here, um, for those of you who are, are gluten-free, I'll, I'll move this stand. We have um, some tasty, tasty wafers uh, that you can uh, take and dip into this cup that will be standing right here. We'll have two communion stations on either side. Um, we also invite you to use this time as a time of prayer. So if you feel so moved to light a candle or perhaps write a, a, a note to jot something down as a, as a way of, of praying to God, you're able to do that. If you feel as though you want to kneel at the altar that's underneath the Pride Pargas flag, you're invited to do that as well during this time of worship. If the communion stewards would come forward, I invite you to join us as you are able. Will you all please bow your heads with me? And let's have a moment of prayer together. God who holds us steady. All too often, we wear masks that allow us to drift in and out of our counterfeit selves, depending on who we are in proximity to. There are days when we feel so disconnected from ourselves that we wonder if anything is real at all. Turn us towards the part of us that are true. Give us the courage to disentangle ourselves from our masks. Keep us from demonizing our false selves. Help us to hold those masks in compassionate care because we know that every mask is the result of an unhealed wound. Take us on a closer walk with you as we explore parts of our inner worlds that we have always hesitated to go. And on this journey, may we listen for the sound of your name and may we hear the sound of our own genuine. Amen. You know, part of the reason why I get so emotional when I think of these songs is because of how amazing our band is and how amazing our musicians are. They're so talented. We can go from playing with, you know, with little kids, a little jaunty tune, I think is what you might call that, to singing music like this. It's just, we're really fortunate to uh, be blessed with the kind of worship music that we can have in this space. Um, again, I want to uh, make an announcement that Queer Group is actually meeting right after service. So I think maybe like, is that rest up here? Uh, like maybe quarter after. So probably got about like maybe 15 minutes or so, and then people meet in the courtyard. Um, the newish, new, basically it's not members. If you've been here for a little bit, but you want to get to know me a little bit better, Julian Wesley, um, or if you're new, it could be your first time. We're gonna have food in there. You're more than welcome to come and join us to sit down for a meal and just to kind of catch up and hang out. I would love to get to know you all a little bit better. Um, and, and yeah, so those are the announcements, and I invite you now to receive the benediction. May the grace of God go with you as you leave this place. May you find strength and courage by modeling what we see in Jesus, a commitment to loving God and loving ourselves, a commitment to sitting in solitude, discerning who we are, and taking that that awareness, that self-knowledge out into the world and upon which to build relationships to each other. And may the Holy Spirit guide us in such ways that these relationships can sustain us, that in discovering the sound of our own genuine, we are able to begin to listen for the sound of the genuine in others. And let all of God's children say, 
Amen. 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 I'll see y'all next week. Thank you.